Hey everybody, it's Mark Thompson and welcome back to the Chief Executive Podcast. I was recently reflecting on some great interviews over the years and wanted to share this one with Herb Kelleher, one of the founders of Southwest Airlines. He was just so famously friendly and funny. It struck me how Herb's insights and business lessons are as relevant today as they've ever been. He, going way back to the late 60s, was the first guy to sketch on a paper napkin this idea of having a customer experience that you could actually create a relationship even on a discount bus known as the Southwest Airline. I mean, think about it. It's a simple idea. Make a local airline that moves quickly and easily between major cities. And what he was hoping to do is bring families together, to bring small businesses to a level playing field with big companies because he wanted to provide a cheaper fare. And when you went on Southwest Airlines, it could often be a hilarious experience because he gave full permission for all of the staff and the flight attendants to do the craziest things to please people and to make them feel welcome and a part of the family, even though they were just having to be shepherded from one big city to another. Herb has been praised over the decades as an outstanding leader, one of the greatest CEOs of all time, named the most admired CEO of the year, even by Forbes magazine. I flew to Dallas to Love Field, as we call it. You know, he's the guy with a tattoo on his shoulder with a big heart on it. And his heart is bigger than the entire airport. When I arrived in Dallas, he, he sat me down and he said, so what do you want to talk about today, Mark? And he said, you know, I'd much prefer to talk about followership than leadership because that story on the proverbial napkin had to do with rallying the people to be able to provide a service to customers and a service to passengers and bring them together on airlines in ways that could only be done in a uniquely Herb Kelleher way. Listen to Herb. Yeah, actually, uh, it still has the glass marks on it uh, from our strategic thinking session. And, uh, you know, we visualized uh, uh, an airline providing lower fares and better service for the state of Texas. It was an intrastate carrier to start off because you couldn't get a certificate from the uh, Civil Aeronautics Board. The federal government just didn't issue any. It was, in effect, suppressing competition in favor of the incumbent carrier. So we said, we're going to have to start it in Texas or nowhere, and we did. When you think about this um, conundrum between um, being a, a follower and a leader when it comes to customers, yes. uh, and think about then this business school question of do employees or customers come first. Yes. How do you, how do you face that? As well, a I don't regard it as a conundrum. Uh, we've always said in somewhat of an iconoclastic way in the old days, uh, it's not so iconoclastic now because I think more people are subscribing to the tenant. Uh, but we always said that uh, the employees come first. Uh, you have to uh, serve those customers. And if those customers are happy, if they feel that they're really participating in something worthwhile on a meaningful basis, uh, then they treat your outside customers better. And that brings your outside customers back. And your shareholders love that. Uh, so it used to be posed as a conundrum, but I really don't think it is. I think that the uh, order priority is very clear. And I think more and more people are, are following that. How do you go about picking good people? What are you looking for in an employee? Well, when we look at people, we look for attitude, basically. Uh, we think that we can teach most of the skills uh, that they need. Uh, but you can have a very skilled person with a bad attitude, and you can't change that. Uh, if we were successful at doing that, frankly, I'd be on Park Avenue with a big black couch making $100,000 an hour treating people. And uh, we have neither the time nor the expertise to accomplish that. So we're looking pe for people who are self-starters, uh, people who are optimistic, uh, people who like a challenge, uh, people who like other people. They like serving other people. They're altruistic uh, in that sense. And, uh, you know, if you have that wonderful attitude that we're looking for, uh, then we can basically teach you to do anything that needs to be done uh, insofar as airline operations and functions are concerned. But if you don't have that attitude, there's not a lot we can do uh, to change that. Now, that's not to say that you don't have to keep feeding uh, those good attitudes as you would uh, keep fueling a fire, I guess uh, might be an apt analogy. Uh, so you try to create an environment at work uh, that people really enjoy, uh, where they feel liberated uh, to be themselves. They don't have to be uh, uh, something else uh, just because they're in the workplace. If they uh, like to tell jokes, they can tell jokes. If they like to do practical jokes, they can do practical jokes. Uh, uh, if they have ideas, they're respected. And so we try to keep a stimulating environment alive as well 
at work. So it keeps those good attitudes percolating and it keeps that creativity and that imagination uh, still coming. You've got all these creative, innovative people that you're encouraging this way. How do you make choices about what to do? How do you focus that energy so that you've got the... Well, you have to be, first of all, I don't think that you can focus too early. Uh, I think that you have to be receptive to a whole conjury of ideas uh, because, you know, the first time that you say no uh, without considering anything, you have shut the door on future ideas from that particular person. So we're very receptive to all kinds of ideas, a plenitude of ideas, and then we try to analyze them in a reasonable, uh, uh, forthright uh, way as to whether it's going to make a contribution to the way that Southwest Airlines functions or not. And we try to give everybody an answer within a relatively short period of time uh, really as a matter of respect, as a matter of honoring them as individuals. And we may say, no, we can't do this. But we don't ever say no, just no, uh, because that's an exercise of power uh, in and of itself. We say, no, we're unable to do this for the following six reasons, uh, because we want you to know that we respect you, and we're telling you why we can't do this and why it would be detrimental to Southwest Airlines. Or you might have another course of action where you say, we're not really sure whether this will work out in actuality uh, the way you envisioned it in theory, so we're going to test it for a while. We're going to put it out in the field for six months and see what happens uh, and give it empirical exposure, uh, which is the best basis for, for judgment with respect to any proposal. And so we test it. We tell them we're going to test it, and we do, and then we give them the results of the test. Uh, but, you know, it's, at Southwest Airlines, we've always said that having a suggestion box indicates that you're a failure as a manager because you shouldn't have to have the intermediary of a box uh, to get people to express their ideas. That if you're really participating with your people, if you're really communicating uh, with your folks on a regular basis, they'll tell you their ideas. <laughs> you don't need any box into which they can put anonymous suggestions for fear that they might be penalized for being imaginative. They ought to be just deluging you with them all the time if you have the appropriate relationship. How did you decide who you surround yourself with and, and how do you pick a successor? <clears throat> well, I think you pick a successor basically by looking at what the needs of the company are, number one. And then you look at how people work with one another because you have to take that into account. Uh, you can have two very excellent people uh, that simply can't function, uh, you know, as a team. And so you have to be very aware of those things. Then thirdly, you look at people and say, how well do they understand what we're doing? Uh, how well do they understand the philosophy and values of Southwest Airlines. And so you go through a whole process, and when you go through that process, I think fairly often you come out with a very, very fit, meat, and logical answer uh, as to how it ought to go. And I think that our transition plan uh, is, is an excellent one, and I think it's been very well received, both by the outside world and by the people of Southwest Airlines. I mean, I think they have said to themselves, you know, it seems like it's just right. And another thing I love about it is that, you know, sometimes uh, perhaps uh, people have focused on me as a, as a personality, a deficient personality, but some type of personality. And I think for the first time, in a very tangible way, uh, this reveals the tremendous management depth and talent that Southwest Airlines has. We didn't have to go outside the company to find enormously talented and capable people. They were all inside. As you think about this, why did you decide now to be that time? Well, actually, we, the board and I had been discussing the subject of succession for quite some time. I don't mean continuously at every board meeting for hours and hours, uh, but uh, on and off for a couple of years, uh, we had sessions on succession and what we thought we were looking for and why we thought we were looking for it and what would be the best for Southwest Airlines, which sometimes has to be judged based on the circumstances in which you find yourself at any given time. I mean, you can't be oblivious to the outside world and the, and the challenges that are being presented in making these evaluations and these, and these determinations. And uh, finally, uh, the board and I agreed that I would announce a transition succession plan when I became 70, uh, which I did on March 12th. Now, I see you looking at me in stark disbelief uh, that I could be that old. And I'm sorry to shock you in that way, but I really am 70. It's not possible. Yeah, yeah well, I, I'll tell you what has contributed to that is the, is the very regular uh, life that I have led and the wellness program that I have followed. It's that marathon work that you do. It's the marathon work. Sometimes I just get possessed. You know, I go out to jog three miles or five miles, I do 10 or 12. Mm, that's amazing. When I think about the, the 
the fun you're having here and also the fun that we have in the, the company overall when you look at Southwest. I walk down the hallways coming in here today and see the the parties, the celebrations, the birthdays, the bar mitzvahs, the confirmations. <laughs> right. no. Did and you see the pet wall? I didn't see anything oh, on the, the annual pet. meeting of shareholders, but... Uh. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> well, sometimes that's kind of a circus, too. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Everything has its own senses. But we though. really wanted to feature our people uh, right. in the building. And uh, I think one of my favorites is the pet wall, uh, where we invited people to bring their pets in. Uh, if they didn't have what they regarded as a suitable photograph, uh, we had some professional animal photographers and they could bring their pets in to have them photographed. And I'll tell you what, it was pretty interesting to see the German shepherds along with the rabbits and the gerbils there at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they can help me with my phone. Highly entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> and we were very lucky because there was never a gerbil or a rabbit that was missing. <laughs> <laughs> that instead of a photographic subject turned out to be a meal. <laughs> <laughs> now you hate bureaucracy and, and you empower your people with a lot of individual authority. Yes. How do you, how do you prevent a sense of anarchy? How do, you, how do you get them focused going the right way? Well, you know, uh, there's an old saying that uh, in peacetime the military wants managers and in wartime the military wants leaders. And uh, uh, we're at war uh, in the airline industry in a competitive way all the time. So we're constantly looking for leaders rather than managers and administrators. And what I mean by that is we're looking for people that show the way sometimes in you know, very stressful, difficult, uh, competitive circumstances. So we encourage people to take the lead. I mean, it's obvious that you have to have a certain amount of processes. Uh, you have to have a certain amount of records. As you get bigger, you have to have more of those. But we still want people to be free to express their idiosyncrasies, to give us the uh, out-of-the-box ideas uh, that they have, because that's the only way that you progress. I mean, look at Southwest Airlines. Southwest Airlines is an invention in and of itself, and uh, uh, just its very being. And uh, uh, probably 99.9% .9 of the people that I talked to about Southwest Airlines when I was helping to start it, I thought it was just a terrible idea and would be a total disaster. And so sometimes you have to be iconoclastic enough to buck the tide, to swim against the tide, uh, and to uh, have great perseverance and faith in your own ideas. Uh, you look at things like uh, Southwest Airlines being the leading airline insofar as ticketless sales are concerned. We invented that, basically invented it out of necessity. If you look at Southwest Airlines being a leader in net sales, that's something else that came about because of fundamentally of the imagination and the ingenuity uh, of our own people. I thought it was because you're a technical maven. That's your reputation, at least. Well, actually, I, I do want to tell you that I've achieved somewhat of a triumph for me. Uh, I got a new car which has a GPS, and they programmed the Anatole Hotel in it. So I had to sleep at the Anatole for three weeks because that was the only destination I could find <laughs> using my deep GPS. But the other day, I managed to get the Luby's Cafeteria on Northwest Highway inserted in it, too. So now I don't have to eat at the Anatole. I can go to the Luby's for my meals and just sleep at the Anatole. But I'm working on it. Now, you've been, you've been kind of the internal <laughs> IT guinea pig, haven't you, as things have been tr Listen, tried out? Listen, do you know what? When they brought in the new... Uh, the new reservation system, the new front end, uh, they brought it down to me to try it. And the theory was that if he can do it, anybody can. <laughs> what, what is this about technology? You've, you've commented about how it can be kind of a servant or a god, or sometimes yep. it can even uh, create impotence. Uh, well, you have to be very judgmental with respect to it. Uh, you have fads with respect to a whole lot of things uh, throughout the history of America and of, of human life, uh, as an example. And I think the recent bubble that burst uh, with respect to the dot-coms is uh, illustrative of, of what I'm referring to. Technology is very helpful if you bring it in for a purpose that is generally pragmatically useful. Technology is not helpful if you bring it in just because you like to fiddle with it uh, or you want to say, hey, I'm keeping up with the Joneses. You know, the Joneses have this program. Now I have it too, so they can't look down on me. You have to approach it very pragmatically and say we need it to accomplish something substantive and worthwhile. And that's why I'm somewhat judgmental with respect to it. Many years ago, I read an article on the uh, Harvard Business Review, and it showed the five stages that companies go through with respect to technology. And they're lagging a little bit behind, and everybody gets panicked and says, oh my lord, you know, everybody has a lot more technology than we do. And then they go out and spend five times as much as they should, 
And they go through that fourth stage where you see this tremendous balloon in costs, where instead of being a cost reducer, it's a cost increaser. And then you get back to the fifth stage where they're paring everything down again. And what I told our people was, we're going to avoid the fourth stage. We'll go one, two, three, five without going through four. So we've tried to approach it on a cost-benefit basis where you're really getting some benefits that are worthwhile out of it. Uh, we haven't succumbed to uh, a lot of the, uh, the mania about uh, high tech. Looking back at your, uh, your career back at the time when you were a trial lawyer, what, what did you learn about the personality of leaders and the type of person who would be successful in that kind of role or in a role in any leadership role? Well, I think that you have to be totally devoted to your cause. You can't have any misgivings. You can't have any questions about it. Uh, if you're going to win cases uh, in court, you have to believe in them with your heart. You have to convey that to the jury. You have to let the judge know that you're sincere, not just sincere, but impassioned about what you're doing. And I think uh, having that sort of passion is one of the criteria for being a leader. And it can't be a hypocritical thing. It can't be a phony thing. It has to be entirely genuine. And when people see that you're a fire uh, with your idea and your cause, uh, they generally tend to uh, be more susceptible to uh, getting excited about it themselves. And the second thing I think you have to do is you have to demonstrate that you're not in this for yourself. Uh, you're in it for everybody. In other words, you're not there to milk off the proceeds <laughs> and disappear into the night. You're there to create something that you hope has, is very long-lived, provides a lot of job security, uh, provides cars, mortgages, uh, the wherewithal to have babies, uh, the requisite financial wherewithal to send those babies to college. And uh, you really look at kind of the, the societal good that it does for your own employees. And also you focus on the good that what you're doing does for, for society as a whole. And that's why we came. I wanted a, I wanted a signature line uh, that was very meaningful, something that really said internally, hey, you're doing more than just your job. You're doing a whole lot for the American people. And uh, that's how we came up with the symbol of freedom, because we are a symbol of freedom. And when you think about it, uh, we go into a new city pair market, okay? And let's say there's been 90,000 passengers a year flying back and forth between these two cities. Uh, we're there for a year, and guess what? There's five, six hundred thousand passengers flying back and forth. Now, they're not doing that because we're shanghaiing them. Uh, they're doing it because they want to do it. And except for Southwest Airlines, they would not be able to do it. So we have freed up the American people to fly, and I think that ought to give all of our people a real good feeling uh, that we're not just doing something for ourselves, we're doing something for the entire community, for America as a whole. You're talking about people from the Rio Grande Valley that are seriously ill, that they used to have to put in the back of a station wagon to go to MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston to be treated, and it would take them six hours riding in a mattress in the back of a station wagon to get there. Now they can fly Southwest Airlines, be there in 45 minutes, and uh, it's a much more comfortable ride than they had experienced. Uh, it's the grandmother that writes me and says, uh, you know, I'm really grateful to Southwest Airlines because my grandson is graduating from San Diego Naval Training School and I never would have been able to go to his graduation if I had to pay the fares that other airlines charge. So we enabled that grandmother to get to that graduation. And when I tell you these stories, uh, what I'm really is trying to do is encapsulate the breadth of it and what it means to people personally as well as in their business lives. And it's, it's huge. If you were to think about whether there was a personality for a leader, is there one personality? I don't know that there is one personality because I've seen people be successful leaders with a variety of personalities. So I don't think it's so much personality as I think it is values and dedication. I think you can have different types of personalities be successful leaders if people believe, number one, that they're sincere and genuine about uh, the cause the crusade, the business. Number two, if people realize that they're not doing this for their own personal advantage, uh, they're doing it for the well-being of all the people that work with the organization. I think that uh, you can have different personalities if you create a value system that everybody understands and can subscribe to. So I don't think it's necessarily a matter, pure matter of personality. I think to a great extent uh, it has to do with character and values. You approach your work and your life with a sense of fun. Was there a time in your life when you didn't have those as primary values 
driving the, the way you... <laughs> no. I must confess to you, I'd like to say that it was something that I did extensive research on and spent many years developing, many torturous, difficult, but dedicated years. Uh, but actually, I think I was born with kind of a, uh, you know, an optimistic view with respect to everything. Thanks for listening to the Chief Executive Podcast. I'm Mark Thompson, and please don't forget to like and subscribe for more episodes every week.